those in US and good afternoon to those in UK and Europe. Good evening, good day to all of you. Welcome to our webinar on scaling philanthropy for India's social transformation. I'm Ashank Desai. Uh, I am an alumnus of IIT Bombay and co-founder of IT company Mastech. I am also chairman of Wills Charitable Foundation, where I am proud of recent recognition given to us by Niti Ayo as an official NGO partner for technology transfer and innovation. This is a great achievement to be recognized at a national level. My biodata, as also the bios of all speakers, will be projected on the screen. So in the interest of time, I will make only brief introduction and request you to refer to our banners and websites for more details on our distinguished speakers. The mission of our wheels is to offer livelihood and sustainability where solutions do not exist. We encourage research and development at IITs and other similar institutions through sponsorship. We work in collaboratively with partners like IEEE, IEEE, ISV, CII, the National uh, Industry Association, Mission Samruddhi, Sevak, Spoken Tutorials. These are all very, very laudable programs and NGOs and many others. Lately, we embarked on an integrated approach for smart village development. Uh, we'll talk about it later, where entrepreneurship is at the core of making this project sustainable. So we'll take one village or cluster of village and make them smart as we define it. A brief introduction to wheels activity was presented anyway prior to the start of this event. And we'll also run at the conclusion. So please have a look at it. Basically, we are a volunteer organization and depend on the generosity of our many donors who believe that scale can only be the achieved by leveraging technology, because we are all technology guys with our background. Uh, you can also get additional information at our website, www.wheelsglobal.org and wheelscharitable.org. These are two websites. Uh, this webinar is made possible by a generous grant from Smita and Ashok Siddhanti of Endyna Inc., an environmental health and safety consulting company based in Washington, D.C. A quick disclaimer, though, all views expressed by all our speakers today in this webinar are obviously their own and do not reflect nor endorsed by Wheels Global and Charitable Foundation or its board members. Now, some housekeeping messages. All attendees are on mute throughout this webinar. You may ask questions to the speakers by entering it in Q&A box. If you need any help, you can chat with one of us by raising your hand or typing your request in the chat box. You may also send us the questions via email to, please note, info, I-N-F-O, info at wheelsglobal, W-H-E-E-L-S, E-L-O-B-A-L, wheelsglobal.org. A recording of this event anyway will be available to all of you on our website and on YouTube and Facebook. And questions from audience will be curated and channeled to the speakers uh, by myself. Uh, because as usual, this is a series of events. This is a 12th event and we get hundreds and hundreds of questions. So we need to curate it in the space of time. So pardon if we can't answer all the questions, but we'll try best. In the many webinars that Wills has hosted, we have noticed that the key message that has come out is that when institutions and NGOs start to collaborate, there is a huge multiplier effect. Hence, collaboration, communication, and sharing back best practices is key to the better development. We all realize so many NGOs doing such a great work, but remain very small with very little impact at the national level. If they could become large, they could make difference to the country. As most of us who are involved in philanthropic activities have experienced, it's not easy to scale though. 
uh, our work as it requires the state funding, good organization, focus, dedicated volunteers, as well as pay staff, above all, governance, management, as you call it, to make it happen at that scale. So the objective of today's webinar is exactly that. That's what we wanted to tackle. Because if you want to make change happen at the national level, which we can, we need to scale up and we need to have a large presence. So what we are going to learn about are three things, three things. Models for scaling up charitable efforts. What are the models? How can we scale? What are those models which are working, which we have a good example about? Building organizational structures for delivering services, which is key, as all of you know. Uh, and strategies for fundraising, which is always a resource for making things happen. Strategies for recruiting, training, volunteers, service personnel, and roles and responsibilities of the board, which is this governance part that I talked about. So today's webinar offers us to learn from four highly respected philanthropies that have implemented very successfully these models with tangible and measurable impact. Our moderator is Mr. Arjun Malhotra. Uh, he's an icon in India and also in US, as all of you know. He has been involved with Antara Foundation, IIT, IIT, and was also the chairman of WILS in its formative years. Of course, he is well known as a co-founder of HCL, which is started in his home garage and grew to become among the largest IT companies in the world. Arjun is an alumnus of IIT Kharagpur and winner of Dr. B. C. Roy Gold Medal Award. Please welcome Arjun. Arjun, please take over. Thank you, Ashant, for this very kind introduction. I basically wanted to spend a few moments and talk about what I think is going to be the impact of uh, NGOs in India and how that impact is going to meet the objectives that Ashok talked about in his message. I think uh, NGOs, the first thing I believe is that NGOs do make a difference. Uh, a lot of them locally, some of them in a slightly larger area, some of them statewide, and very few of them nationally. I think NGOs have to have a vision of what they want to do. Do they want to make that difference in a local area? Do they want to make that difference at a statewide, statewide uh, kind of uh, impact? Or do they want to do it nationally? I think that's the vision they have to start with. And then they have to implement according to what they want to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. I <clears throat> Excuse me. I think a couple of things that uh, are very important today, especially with the environment in India, is that compliance is becoming a very big issue. In fact, uh, the recent uh, uh, new law that was passed for FCRA, uh, the rules of which I think are still being made out, uh, is an important part of that compliance. So I think NGOs today have to spend a lot more time and effort on making sure that they are compliant and don't run into problems uh, with the government in terms of compliance. I think the key to being compliant is also to be transparent. Uh, NGOs tend to, at least that's a complaint I've heard very often, that they tend not to be transparent. I think that's one important message that you have to be transparent. I think the other important message for NGOs is that you have to find a way to get resources and that's just not money, but also people. So as uh, Ashank mentioned, that's an important part. And hopefully, uh, as we go through our speakers, uh, some of those uh, messages, some of those actions, some of those models uh, will become available. I think ultimately, you have to look at a way to becoming self-sustaining. You know, probably India's largest NGO and most successful one, as far as I know, Akshay Patra, which feeds some 3 million or more kids their meals every day, today needs something like 300 crores every year to sustain themselves. They're doing a great effort in being able to raise that money, but they are only addressing 1.5% of the children who need these meals. If they want to get that to a higher number, and let's say you want to look at doing it 100% of the children in India, 
And if you don't change your model, can you imagine the amount of money they're going to need every year to make it sustainable? It just is unimaginable. So I would recommend to all NGOs that they should find a way to become self-sustaining over time. The other thing I wanted to mention was you need to make sure that you motivate your people. You know, working in NGOs sometimes can become very frustrating because you come across a lot of uh, what you feel are roadblocks that are just unnecessary. And, you know, facing them every day can become very demotivating, not just for the person running the NGO, but for all the people working in there. So you need to find a way to motivate your people to make sure that they uh, are, if I use the word, charged to perform in their environment. Uh, there have been a number of experiments. I, uh, I won't go into them right now to try and give you the details, but uh, if any of you are interested, I'd be quite happy to share them with you. I think the other very important part, if you want to scale, at least in India, is you have to collaborate with government. And not just government, you have to collaborate with other NGOs that uh, are in the same area and that can extend whatever you're doing. So please remember that's an important part. A lot of us tend to think of the government as someone we don't want to get involved with or something that we want to try and avoid. But if you really want to go national in India, you have to uh, collaborate with the government. And I think you'll find that message coming out when the speakers talk to you. You know, the other thing I want to mention is as we go and look at problems in India, there's a lot of data available. And I'll give you an example from many years ago when I was in HCL and the government of Andhra Pradesh in those days wanted to get a big World Bank grant uh, for the irrigation department to provide drinking water within three kilometers of every village. Uh, Professor Ramarao at Voltaire University in Vizag uh, actually uh, talked to me and we did, a, we did a study to look at all the previous reports that had been done on groundwater availability and water availability. And we then presented the paper to then Rajiv Gandhi, who was the prime minister, saying that you only needed five lakhs to provide that objective of water within three kilometers to every village if you looked at all the historical work that had been done. And of course, they didn't, uh, the irrigation department in Andhra Pradesh didn't like it at all because it jinxed their big World Bank grant. But I just wanted to mention that example because there's a lot of data, a lot of work has already been done. So before you start looking at doing something as an NGO, please look at what's already been done and you'll find that, uh, you know, just resurrecting some of that old work does help. Um, the other and the last point I want to make is that it's very important to set up the right processes. You can't keep running the NGO and doing, you know, what you're doing all the time. You have to set it up so that it can work automatically. And here, I'm sure uh, when Ashok Alexander speaks to you about what they're doing at Antara Foundation, he'll be able to talk about some of the processes that they've been set, that they've been able to set up, especially in the state of Rajasthan, that are making that whole uh, activity, the benefit of what they're trying to do self-sustainable for that state, so that they require very little handholding to, to keep continuing to do what they're doing. At this point, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'd like to uh, finish my dialogue and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Mr. Ron Mehta. He is an alumnus of IIT Bombay, a board member of Wheels, and a very successful entrepreneur. He is the champion for the W in Wheels, which stands for water. He is the executive director of the Wheels India Nishwat Foundation, which is dedicated to the application of technologies that help to make portable water accessible to all. Over to you, Ron. Thank you very much, Arjun. And it's a great pleasure to be able to present my uh, thoughts on uh, what we can do in the area of water and sanitation and in maternal and child health. 
So to give you a very brief uh, idea, the very topic today, scaling philanthropy for India's social transformation is exactly how the Wynn Foundation Wheels India Niswath Foundation was founded a little more than two years ago. Uh, essentially, what we are is a we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit foundation founded in the US, a private foundation with a single donor, Mr. Chirag Patel and his family. Uh, Chirag is a very quiet and effective uh, Indian American billionaire, uh, co founded Amnil uh, Pharmaceuticals. So, two and a half years ago, when Wheels was having its annual gala in New York, I approached him to get a donation for $50,000 to build five clean drinking water plants in remote villages in Gujarat at Sevak sites. Um, he not only readily agreed to do that, but he expressed a strong desire to, and I, it sounds trite, but I'm going to try and repeat the words that he mentioned. He said, in a very small way, he would like to become like the mini Bill Gates of India and give away bulk or majority of his wealth, not when he was 75 years old, but while he was able to do what he can. He currently is only around 53 years old. So his two desires were that he wanted to work only with IIT guys, which is a real uh, feather in our cap. Uh, I guess we can pat our, our backs in, in that sense because most of, many of you are IITians. And second, since he came from Gujarat, he wanted to work at an IIT in Gujarat at that time he didn't know that there was an IIT in Gandhinagar. Nevertheless, with um, help from Rajat, Suresh, Anil Bhandari, Hiten, we formed Wheels India Niswad Foundation. And in only in the two areas of the donor's interest to do pioneering work to support innovations in water and sanitation and in maternal and child health issues. The goal of our foundation is not to write white papers, but essentially do actual innovations on the ground to improve the daily lives of poor in the lowest economic strata of Indian society. We work with IITs, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Bombay, IIT Gandhinagar, recently with IIT Madras, and also with very well-known and well-vetted NGOs, because one of the first things we learned was that there are a lot of people who will come to you asking that they can help out in the areas of our um, expertise, our areas that we want to work on. But it is very important to vet them and ensure that they actually have the strength to accomplish that. To give you an idea about where, what we have done in the past two years, because we don't have enough time, so I will just quickly tell you that at IIT Bombay, we have two different projects, one with a really smart chemistry professor called Chandramoli Subramaniam, who has clearly demonstrated that using a system, using car carbon nanotechnology, he has been able to show that he can remove 85 to 90% of the dissolved solids using uh, in a five liter flask or a five liter matka, if you will, no more than a double A battery will remove 90% of the contaminants. And the amount of water backflow, which in the RO reversible osmosis systems is as high as 50%, in his case, it is less than 10%. And it is a phenomenal technique. We have spent a fair amount of money and we are in the process of building the prototypes to demonstrate at individual grassroots village level. Second project we did was with the Center for Technology Alternatives and Rural Areas, where they have developed a complete model water and sanitation plan for a mid-size, um, small-size town or a large village that can be implemented. We are doing a great project at IIT Kharagpur, where with a 
fairly significant grant from our Win Foundation. They have built a model uh, 0.3 million uh, gallons per day treatment plant where they are taking sewage from IIT Kharagpur campus and by using various multi-stage modular systems, they are able to convert that into portable water. Um, at IIT Gandhinagar, we have worked with several different professors to use surface engineered uh, particles to remove 99.999% of the bacteria coliform and also uh, development of a cost-effective arsenic removal system. But the project that is nearest and dearest to my heart is what I show in number four. We have jointly worked with Tata Power's AC CSR and a fantastic hydrogeology group called Arid Communities and Technologies, where we have worked in over 40 to 50 villages where they've used the concept of participatory groundwater management by basically converting defunct bore wells into recharge wells during the only one month in a year when it rains in Kutch, Gujarat, and also to build embankments. That way they've been able to bring up the water table by almost 100 to 200 feet in many areas and reduce the salinity level by 50%. Also training of high school graduates called Bhujal Jankars. Going on further in the area of maternal and child health, this is where, as a young nonprofit, we learned our lesson. We spent initially a fair amount of money for a year to deal on uh, maternal and child health issues, um, working with a very well known um, institution in public health. Unfortunately, their goals and our goals were very different. We wanted actual interventions on the ground and their goals were to publish papers. So we parted company. Again, we learned our hard lesson. And since then we have basically tied up where actual interventions are carried out. Two of the projects that I would like to talk here are the one with Sitara at IIT Bombay, where we have helped them to develop a child nutrition lab to build food-based nutrition approach where we have been able to take, uh, make, help them in uh, developing eggless eggs or in idlis not made with rice, but with other stuff and it tastes as good. We also have a, a really smart adjunct professor at Sitara called Dr. Rupal Dalal, who has, who is a pioneer. She's a pediatrician by training in the US went back to India and has actually done breastfeeding, you know, training of breastfeeding to infants, which has had successful results in improving malnutrition levels. To further that, to develop it to scale, we have funded uh, Professor Kanan Mudgalia's spoken tutorial project, where we are now got over 41 videos in um, health and nutrition in more than 20 different Indian languages and millions of Anganwadi workers, ASHA workers, a and workers, midwives, and others are doing that, along with intensive training provided by Dr. Rupal Dalal. We also work with micro entrepreneurs in Bangalore and in Mahila Housing Trust in Ahmedabad that operates in seven different states. Some of the other areas that we have helped support in the area of maternal and child health is the use of really fabulous non-invasive device called Touch Hub B, developed by a physician who actually got an MTech at IIT Bombay. Uh, he developed a company, started a company called Biosense. And this is the only non-invasive device that can measure the hemoglobin levels without pricking your finger for any blood or anything. This device has been given to uh, the Sevaks at, with Sevak Foundation, and more than, I believe now the number is closer to 40,000 women who have been screened in various villages in Gujarat. We've also worked with other, uh, not, you know, a startup company called Parisodhana for uh, air activated self-heating blankets, and with another company called Black Frog 
for portable refrigeration carrier for vaccines. To give you an idea of the impact that we reached with ACT in Kutch and Tata Power, we actually have now worked in close to 100 villages. Water structure recharges, more than 700 of them, has touched a population base of over 5 lakhs and has bridged the water deficit by 2.58 MCM. So far, our foundation has been able to distribute in an effective manner over $2 million of um, donation from our sole donor. We have so far not approached the government because we believe we first need to demonstrate before we can go to scale. The takeaway so far is that we want to do and continue to do work at the grassroots level where innovations in our work is extremely important. We work with a diverse type of partners, work with the most elite IITs, with NGOs who have specific knowledge in that area. We also maintain extremely close interaction. Although I sit here in New Jersey, I am in daily touch with our full-time director of Win India programs who resides in Ahmedabad, uh, another IIT Bombay and IIM alumnus, uh, Paresh Vora. We actually are very flexible and we have no compunction in cutting off a grantee if we don't believe that our goals are not achieved. Once the pilots, uh, we believe that our good pilots are our best uh, advocacy. I'll very quickly show you the concept of what I was talking about of using carbon nanotubes for um, um, removal of 90% more of the contaminants from water with a wastage of between five and 10%. What you see on the right hand bottom side is a device called Chakra, which is, and I won't get into the details, anyone who has an interest, I can put you in touch with uh, Professor Chandramoli Subramaniam but we are, we are very confident that this device, when we build the prototypes, ultimately when the COVID pandemic is over, will actually take us to some um, really great results. These are some of our various partners. We were spawned out of wheels and I cannot thank the uh, wheels organization for allowing us to be able to achieve in two of the areas of wheels in a very effective manner. We also work with many other ecosystem and outreach partners, startups, and institutions that I well defined. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate your remarks and we'll come back to you with questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ashok Alexander. He is the founder director of the Antara Foundation, a nonprofit focused on public health delivery at scale. Prior to establishing Antara Foundation, Ashok headed the India operations of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He led the creation and expansion of the foundation's India office from its inception in 2003 until 2012. There he created Avahan, India's first national or India's national AIDS program, which rapidly became the world's largest ever private HIV prevention program. Ashok is a graduate of St. Stephen's College, Delhi, a postgraduate from the Delhi School of Economics and, and has an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. He is a founding board member of the Public Health Foundation of India and served on the board of Care India and has been a founding trustee of the American India, America India Foundation. Over to you, Ashok. Ashok, you're on mute. You might want to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Arjun, and thank you to uh, Wheels for inviting me. It's an honor to speak here. And uh, let me just put up something which I hope will show up. Can everyone see this, I hope? This slide of mine? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, so let me get, get started. Uh, my understanding of wheels, what they're setting out to do in philanthropy is really 
as they say, it's not about check writing. It's about entrepreneurial philanthropy, uh, which really means things of the philanthropist as a person who's taking risk, looking at innovations, trying to move through paths that have not been taken before. Now, this is a very uh, laudable objective, and it will work also if that entrepreneur, that philanthropist has a partner, a partner who can also respond equally with innovation and so on and work as an equal partner. So therefore the thrust of what I'm doing and uh, saying today is about a new donor donee paradigm. That is really the thrust of my conversation here because that relationship to my mind is more rare than practiced in the sector. So I'll go through this and talk about it a little bit and take away some of the lessons that I've learned having spent the last 18 years in, in this sector. I've had a fairly unique vantage point because on the one level heading the Gates Foundation, easily the largest philanthropy in India, uh, I was looking at a portfolio of almost a billion and a half dollars worth of grants. Uh, now, after starting Antara, after 10 years at Gates, the Antara Foundation, I'm another small NGO on the landscape. I'd put it that way, scrounging around for money uh, very often. So this is why this kind of contrast is good for your soul and so on. Uh, I think you learn something from the entire process. And if I sum that up, I would say there are two learnings. One is that it's very, very difficult to give away money in a smart way. And it's very, very difficult to spend that money once you've got it in a smart way. And it's very difficult to have this partnership between two people. So let me go through, if I, if I can, uh, five learnings. Seven issues, I'll call them, and these are, I won't call them issues in terms of problems, but seven huge opportunities for the sector to achieve the kind of virtuous philanthropy that Wheels is talking about. So I'll talk about each of these. The prevalent donor donee paradigm has to be reversed. Prevention should not be neglected. It is massively neglected today by donors. Word scale is used by everyone and very few people really understand what it means. Donors should encourage meaningful evaluation. Knowledge sharing collaborations are badly needed. The community must lead rather than be taken as a helpless uh, beneficiary. And as Arjun said in the beginning, there is no getting away from the fact that you have to partner with government. Let me touch on each one of these in the short time that we have. The prevailing donor donee paradigm looks something like this. I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but more often than not, you have a donor who is the architect of the program because he or she is providing the dollars, is providing the funding. So the donor has an idea that let's do X in this state. Let's do Y in that place. Let's bring innovations to where. Let's use technology. And then the donor looks for an NGO who's an implementer. And the, the uh, implementer's role is to understand what the donor needs and then to implement it exactly in that way to the community. What happens in this is that the NGO is much like a waiter in a restaurant. He's taking an orders. What do you want done, sir? A, B, C, and D. And then he'll go and deliver that to the community. And therein lies the fall off in quality and impact. We are talking about the programs I have been working with at the Gates Foundation and now with the Antra Foundation, try to reverse that, that paradigm. When I led the program for Antra, this first program funded by the Tata Trust, Mr. Ratan Tata had just retired and he knew very little about maternal and child health. I think he would freely have admitted it. I developed an idea by going around and talking to a lot of pregnant and lactating women in villages of Rajasthan trying to understand their problem, talking to government and coming up with a design and proposing it to a donor who said, look, I don't really understand this, explain it to me again. And we spent a lot of time doing this and therein created a game, which I think resulted in innovations that we've introduced now, which have gone to every one of Rajasthan's 46,000 villages. We did the same thing with sex workers when I led the Gates Foundation. We worked directly with the sex workers to understand what they needed rather than come in as so many programs had done, providing condoms because sex workers need condoms. So this has to be changed. We could talk a long time about it, 
but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on. The second aspect is that prevention is being massively neglected. And I'm not trying to denigrate any, other, any of the other causes that, that are well-funded. This is a pie diagram. It shows a 6% of CSR funding in India goes to preventive health. About 30% goes to education. A chunk of it goes to health, almost the same amount as in education. But if you look at the percentage spent within health, it's largely curative treatment. It's largely bricks and mortar, building uh, new hospitals, new clinics, feeding children, treating them, but very little to prevent malnutrition, very little to prevent high-risk pregnancies. That is a more difficult game. And why donors shy away from this, Indian donors, I would say in particular, shy away from this is not clear because simple arithmetic would tell you that the impact of prevention is far more than you know, treating the same problem once it's already happened. Again, I say this without denigrating the work of the many people who work in, you know, uh, in treatment, uh, many people who work in education, but the neglect of prevention is one of the reasons why India has the, one of the worst maternal and child health records in the world. There are a million children under the age of five dying needlessly every year. One third of our kids are malnourished. These are all preventable situations. And this is what we try to do in Antra, the foundation that I, I lead currently. The third is the word scale. I dare say that if you meet 20 NGOs who are implementing and they ask them what you're doing, they'll all say we are working at scale, right? Uh, the term scale has to stop being overused and it has to be better understood. This is the way that I've understood it. The first point that you make with scale is that it is coverage. I want to reach so many malnourished children. I want to reach so many mothers who are pregnant. I want to reach so many sex workers. Coverage is well understood, though frankly many people don't even go as far as defining coverage very carefully. But scale is actually a trade-off between two other factors, speed and quality. Programs can take 10 years to achieve that coverage. Another program may say, I'll do it in six months. Programs may try to achieve coverage with great speed, but have poor quality. Another program may spend five years saying, we got to get the quality right. There is no right or wrong amongst all of these, but this careful consideration, which is the essence of strategy, this is how you run business. No business would jump in someplace and say, we'll achieve coverage without thinking about speed and quality, is the essence of impact. It's the essence of scaling up. And what I like to do in a very friendly way is to challenge people to say, can you define your program in terms of these three parameters working together? Because that is the crux of scale. So the, the actual triangle may look somewhat different when you answer this question. When we ran our HIV AIDS program, we made a decision which seemed controversial. We said in the first year, we will not look at quality. We want huge coverage. The quality may be 60%, but we want to get a condoms out to every sex worker who's practicing. And after that, we build the quality into the program. The fourth thing I'd like to say is that donors must encourage meaningful evaluation. This is also a question to ask. In business, we evaluate the work we do very, very carefully in science and research that is done. But when programs deliver on the ground and when donors have told me we don't budget for evaluation, then there's something seriously wrong here. When donees, the people who, who get grants, often wave their hands and claim, make tall claims about their impact, and there's nothing to back that up and the substance and the data to say, this is the impact that we've had, that we've done a randomized control trial, we've done some other methods of scientific evaluation and qualitative evaluation, donors must encourage this. It, it, because it begins with them. To give you an idea, how much should you spend on meaningful evaluation? There's one school of thought that says it shouldn't be less than 20%. In many programs in India, it's closer to zero. Knowledge sharing, wheels are being reinvented. I set up a company, <clears throat> eponymous company called Alexander Associates, with, set out to, with the premise to say, Look, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of NGOs across India who are working on the same issue. Do they share information? Do they share their knowledge? 
actually we were finding out that the knowledge is not shared people work in silos simply because they don't know that others are working on the same issue and sometimes because they know but knowledge is a source of uh, value it's a way that you can win grants if you have a method a technique that nobody else does and it's the worst reason why knowledge is not shared let me show you some interesting data here ekmat was a program that i i ran with the uh, with the organization that I have called Alexander Associates. On the first axis here, vertical axis area, these are roughly speaking six areas in which people can work. Broad service delivery, community, enabling environment, organization, and so on. But if you break up service delivery, you could think of doing effective frontline work or accessible and affordable service delivery. Now, if you think of accessible and affordable service delivery, just have a look at the map on that has appeared on the right side of this. We visited every one of these. We visited more than 50 organizations. We found a lot of people working in accessible and affordable service delivery, which is crucially important. But if you ask, how do you do that? There are different ways of doing it. Some people do it by infrastructure strengthening. Some, so if you do that, the number comes down. There's some who do it by upgrading their facilities themselves. Uh, there are others who do it by running creches, medical facilities, schools. Point is that if you uh, talk to one of these organizations somewhere in Madurai and you know that there's another one somewhere in Andhra Pradesh doing excellent work of the same kind, they never even heard of each other. So we set up this network basically to say, can you set up a virtuous network of knowledge sharing? I've got to say all stories don't have happy endings. There were really no takers for this, simply because when we went to the donors, they didn't want to see, fund this kind of work. And no organizations themselves were not investing in this kind of work. So all of this knowledge is sitting on our back burner. Finally, I'll end with saying two things. Community must lead, design, deliver, scale, sustain. Community can no longer be taken as that helpless beneficiary. She may be wearing a gungat with her face covered, but she has a lot of power. She may be a sex worker in a brothel in Bombay, but she knows the answer. The reason Avahan scaled up so rapidly is because the program was taken over by sex workers. Because when we freely admitted we didn't know the answer to this complex problem, that's when the community took over. We're doing the same thing right now in Madhya Pradesh, the work we do, maternal and child health, working with women's groups, with adolescent girls, with frontline workers. Every time they lead, they design, they deliver, they enable scale, and because they're a community, they sustain. Finally, I'll end with this. I've met donors who tell me, as soon as I start talking to them about working with government, their eyes kind of glaze over a little. And some of them say, look, we don't really work with government. Government should be providing, we don't really work with them. Now, this is a, this is a, this is a problem because if nobody who talks of scale that without saying I work with government, it's as simple as that. Government is the mothership. Government is the one who has frontline workers in every single village in India. It's got policies and processes that will last reach every every so so very far the model of saying i'll make a pilot somewhere in a few villages and then somebody else will scale it up is known as the hope model because that hope never comes partnership with government you can spend a few hours talking about it but it has a lot to understanding how the bureaucracy works the systems that entail there the relationship of bureaucracy with the political system and so on it's a lifetime uh, it's a lifetime effort I'll stop out here. I'm, I think I've just reached my, my time limit. And thank you very much. Those really are my, my uh, five points. Government is the mothership. Community is all important. Knowledge sharing is uh, absolutely critical and so on. So these are the uh, seven topics that I've raised. And uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you. That was very insightful. Our final speaker is Karthik Kilachan. He is an alumnus of IIT Bombay. Mr. Kilachand holds an MS in Electrical Engineering from Cornell University 
an MBA in international finance from UC Berkeley and the advanced management program degree from INSEAD, France. He is a serial entrepreneur. He started Tasty Bites and also Magnus Gyan for teaching underprivileged children in Brazil and many other companies you can read about in the bio that is on the screen. He is the founder of IITNs for, the, for Influencing India's Transformation or IIT for IIT. Over to you, Karthik. Karthik, I think you're frozen. I think your internet might be giving you trouble. Karthik? Ashank, I think Karthik is having trouble with his internet. Okay. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, I'm just on the end. Karthik, you're frozen again. Yeah, he's frozen again. <laughs> so, how can you try? Let's hope so. Sorry. That's... Can you hear me now, Arjun? Yeah, we can hear you. Karthik, please go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes. You can see your screen, yeah. Yes, we can. Can you hear me now, Arjun? Yes, Karthik, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Arjun, and apologies for the slight technical guffaw. And also thanks to the Wheels Foundation for giving us this opportunity to present the IIT for IIT platform, which is IITN's Influencing India's Transformation. Over the next 10 minutes, I will share with you our vision and who we are then a case study on improving livelihoods, and finally, how we are structured. Our why, which is our mission, is very crystal clear, is harnessing the collective voice of IITNs to give back to India through national scaling of social impact programs. Uh, let me emphasize here collective voice and national scaling. Whilst many of us are contributing to India's social sector individually, we believe that doing so collectively will amplify our impact significantly. The objective really is to create a movement of IITNs from across the globe, from Mumbai, to New York, to San Francisco, to Singapore. So whilst we as a nation have become the world's sixth largest economy, our human development index, the so-called HDI, lags dismally behind. We are currently ranked 129 out of 180th on the UN's HDI index. If we as a nation want a seat at the G7 plus, and more importantly, even want our voice heard, we have to move our HDI significantly. Our model follows three simple steps. As the first, we identify those programs that we believe are designed for national scale, and they must meet three criteria. As Ashok had mentioned earlier, they must have measurable outcomes. 
that address a national need. Second, they must be replicable across states. And third, and most importantly, as Arjun had mentioned, they must be financially sustainable at scale. <clears throat> Next, we work with the program leadership to develop an aspirational 10-year growth plan. Having done that, the final step is to enable the program to build national capabilities over a three-year period which would include expansion to at least two other states, embedding technology, engaging with local and federal government, as Ashok had mentioned, it's a must have, and of course, helping in fundraising. Keep in mind that our role is that of an enabler, what we are calling playing a principal partner role. I will now take you through a case study on improving farmer livelihoods. As we are well aware, more than 40% of India is drought impacted. And most importantly, India is one of the 17 worst affected countries rapidly running out of water. The good news is that the problem is mostly man-made. Hence, the solution is simple. A significant number of the three lakh water bodies that replenish our groundwater are silted up, making them ineffective. The solution is desilting these water bodies. Uh, two foundations, the ATE Chandra Foundation and Caring Friends, both based in Mumbai, have partnered to have successfully desilted 7,000 water bodies or lakes across Maharashtra, resulting in adding 240 billion liters of available water. And most importantly, they have accomplished this across the state's various districts, proving the model's replicability. So here are the outcomes. 6,000 villages impacted, 10 million people benefited from potable water, and 46,000 farmers who have used the silt as rich fertilizer. By providing the equivalent of 4.3 million equivalent tankers of water. So here's a picture of a lake or a water body, which was completely full of silt. I mean, it's unbelievable, this image. This shows the silt which was desilted and now ready to be applied to agricultural farmland as fertilizer. And here is the water body post the monsoons available for potable water. The other big advantage of the desitting model, besides its simplicity, is that the donor state government funding is only 25% of project cost. Whereas 75% of the project is borne by the farmer, since the silt, when used as a fertilizer, improves this yield by 50%, and in parallel, lowers his fertilizer cost by 30 to 40%. We have identified 124 drought districts across 11 states, which have water bodies which need desilting. The effective national impact is providing water to 250 million rural Indians at a one-time cost of merely a hundred million dollars. Once desilted and thereafter maintained, these water bodies will now provide water year on year. A simple back of the envelope calculation shows that based on current cost of rupees 1500 a tanker of 10,000 liters each, this will result in an annual saving 
of $2 billion to the exchequer. Uh, let me just touch on what I'd mentioned earlier of IIT for IIT playing a principal partner role. So we have identified eight strategic areas where IIT, IIT will help build capabilities over the next three years. We start with a cluster approach down to the taluk level. Second, we then identify other water initiatives which are hap happening at taluk level. We then identify the right open source technology which can be used for scaling. Again, as Ashok had mentioned, we then engage with grassroots NGOs, influencers, and government. And of course, we then develop and engage with potential donors. We will be needing technology as these programs scale. And it is very clear that given that what Wheels is doing, there is a huge opportunity for us collaborating with the Wheels Foundation. The IITN model and how we are structured. Launched in January 2018 by my co-founder Joe Fernandez and myself. By the way, we ourselves are a nonprofit entity. We built a global advisory board of nine iconic IITNs, many of whom have led membership-driven organizations similar to ours, such as NASCOM, and IIT, and TAI. Founding members are those IITNs who want to join us on this journey in improving India's HDI by offering their voice. We have 133 so far, and more are joining as we progress. A snapshot of where these founding members are, 52% are in the US, 40% uh, in India, and 8% in Singapore. And within specific cities, we have 28% in the Bay Area in California, 24% in Mumbai, and 16% in New York City. We have two engagement models for founding members to join us on this journey. Model number one, is those founding members who are willing to invest time. And I'm using the water regeneration case study as an example. And we are looking for approximately eight hours per week. The box on the left shows you the two IITNs, Nandan Maluste and Prasad Baji, who have agreed to join us by dedicating this time. The other three boxes are dedicated resources coming in from the two foundations, uh, from Rotary Club, who have agreed to also dedicate resources. And the last box, of course, are the on-ground NGOs. The second model for founding members to join us is by investing their voice. And we estimate basically about two hours per month. Here again, the box on the left are 14 founding members who have agreed to join us for the water project. The other four boxes, again, are the partners who are also going to lend their voice. So do join us on this exciting journey to give back to the country that made us IITNs. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. That was uh, very nice. Uh, I'm going to skip the summarization that I had planned in the interest of time, we have half an hour more in, and I really would like to answer questions from the audience. So over to you, Ashank, if you can take over and uh, go through the questions. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Arjun. <clears throat> so uh, there are quite a few questions. Uh, uh, some of them are from specific panelists, some of them are general. So, uh, 
let me let me let me start with something that we say more specific. So here is a question to uh, no, I think this is uh, you can say general at that extent. Uh, what compromises are made during scale up? Is it possible to scale without diluting outcomes? Can NGO start a project and government help to scale? So any anyone can answer. I think all of you have worked with scaling it up and uh, work with government also. I can I can I take a show. Uh, please, please, please. The show is the best. Please. I can take. Uh, I can take a look at that. Okay, take a look. Two questions: Will dilution happen, and can you work with government yeah, to achieve? Yeah, yeah. Uh, dilution will happen. It's, I mean, it's it's a law of nature. I mean, you can do perfect something on a smaller scale. Naturally, there will be a fall off in quality as you go in larger and larger scale. The question is, how much? I mean, what is the difference between an outstanding quality and very acceptable and even good quality? That is the trade-off that is inevitable because you're handing off the, the program to government and to communities. That has to be accepted. It's a question of defining these quality levels. But let me give you some actual data. We worked in Rajasthan for five years. We developed a, a model which is called the AAA model, which has now gained a lot of attention, where the frontline workers work together on a platform at the village level, sharing data to, to basically serve you know, pregnant women and their, and their children. Now, we did this successfully first in a block, which is about 150 villages, then in two districts, which is about, you know, about 1.2 million population each. We then spoke with government. We had been working through the government system all along. The chief minister of that time, Vasundar Raje, they actually branded this program. They called it Raj Sangam. And today it's running, running in 46,000 villages of Rajasthan. Every single village of Rajasthan. Has the quality been diluted? I'm sure it has. You don't, there's no question about it. But before that, there was no program at all. So this is an example. In, in, when I worked in Avahan, you know, we worked with a lot of sex workers in six states. But ultimately, I say those sex workers together averted more than 600,000 infections. So there is a way of doing it. Government has to, if without government, the scale is not possible. I see. Anyone else want to add something? Yeah. Could I? Uh, yeah. Could yeah. I answer? Yeah. 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 My right. one, uh, the real to scale model that we have actually funded through Win Foundation and still continue to fund in a very large manner is the concept of using spoken tutorials for furthering uh, dissemination of health and nutrition lessons to literally millions of people across India, believe it or not, also across Afghanistan and Iran. So one area where Professor Kanan Mudgalia, who was the founder of this program, was very successful was initially when spoken tutorials started out maybe about eight years ago, it was only related to IT. And the funding, he, lit he literally received not even no funding from IIT Bombay, but other than given space in, um, for accommodating his 40 or 50 employees, uh, they were also had a lot of other roadblocks. I won't go into that. So he received all his funding because of the success of using that for information technology to from the ministry uh, ICT and from MHRD. After that success that they saw, they branched out into uh, health and nutrition and were able to get their program imposed on uh, Reliance Geo. So now it is on a Reliance Geo platform and anyone in India can sign on to it and take advantage of it. That was one example of how scale happened with spoken tutorials. Okay. Arthik, you have anything or say? No, that's fine. Okay. There are a lot of questions on this government partnership. I think this looks like something in the top of mind of everyone because it has its own challenges and opportunities. But I'll skip right now 
next question on government i'll come back uh, there is a question uh, someone is asking all the funders look look at uh, you know highly educated guys iit iims and all that how can we get them to focus on solutions and its potential impact on the scale rather than you know uh, just just looking at founder degrees probably that's what someone is asking uh, so maybe kartik you have any thoughts on that you have you have a lot of founders you have helped can you repeat the repeat the question yeah so so the question is uh, our experience says that fund givers look heavily on the education of the founders you know iit iim for a degree and all that rather than that probably that is the question how can we get them to focus on solutions and impact and you know scaling and those aspects rather than just saying i know <coughs> so that's that's his opinion you may like to comment or challenge on so but karthik can i take this so yeah sure yeah sure so sure. you know i think one of the things people look at when they fund ngos is that they want to make sure that you know that transparency thing i talked about they want to make sure that the money actually goes for what it is being given for and in a way you tend to trust people who come from institutions and iit and iim are just institutions that have that trust right if you can build that trust it's nothing to do with what your degree is or where you are from but if you come from uh, if you can show that you can build that trust with the donor that the money is going to be utilized properly and that he won't find out after the fact that it didn't get used the way it was supposed to get used i think that's really what you've got to do so while inst the the institutions you come from give you that background or make you or the number of people who come from there uh, give the confidence that yes they're likely to be uh, transparent if i use that term i think that's where it, that question is coming from and kartik you yeah. might want to agree or disagree no no yeah, i absolutely kartik. agree and i think just to add to that uh, ashan uh, two things uh, one is of course uh, you know if you look at uh, iitns and iims they have scaled in the commercial sector right they built unicorns from startups and when you uh, get to scaling you obviously have to bring in governance you have to bring in processes you have to bring methodologies so i think it's bringing that level of professionalism into the sector is i mean we may start with iit for iit but i think you know one can expand it to other professionals to come in and join the sector so that it brings in the expertise and experience of scaling i think people look at competence and trust and transparency and both of you are saying i have another question which is hot property so maybe all of you can join in there with recent fcra amendment in the last fortnight what is the panel stake on the scalability of good program on grassroots ngos which are funded by foreign publications and by bigger ngos so everyone is uh, this is a question which is worried person uh, what will happen after this fcra anyone can interpret or figure out anyone arjun ashok kartik so, let me let me try and answer that the okay. little i know is that the rules have still not been set we are still reading the law the way it's written but the government has said that they will define some rules we are hoping that those rules give a little more flexibility than what the law states the way it is written but basically there is some uh bureaucratic overhead that you can only open an account in a state bank branch in delhi and you can only give it directly to the end user you can't go through a middle person and there are some of those uh that will need to be evaluated in a lot more detail i don't you know i don't think we can give any answers at least i don't think i can give any answers right now till we see the rules and get much more clarity on what is happening uh so my take is that yes it's worrisome uh it is going to be restrictive to an extent to what extent let's wait for the rules and then let's see what actions we need to take and what strategies we need to decide on to be able to handle this particular googly that the government seems to have thrown okay 
can I can I answer also yeah, yeah. take a stab on that? We yeah. actually faced that issue about two and a half years, three years ago when we formed Win Foundation. Number one, we had a donor's money available to us, but we could only give it because we did not have an FCRA. We did not have a Win Foundation India. So we did, unfortunately, after spending close to $30,000 with legal fees, we did find a very legitimate and an appropriate manner in which funding could be done. And it's a relatively simple one. You treat the foundation as a, in our case, it was possible because we are a private foundation. So we have our own set of rules and we have to satisfy the US uh, 501c3 requirements. So we have developed a concept of doing services agreement, like a management contract with her, with her, with her, in case with IITs, that's not a problem because they come under a different gambit and essentially they are outside the FCRA. So we would directly donate money to the various IIT foundations in the US like IIT Kharagpur Foundation, IIT Bombay Heritage Foundation, or IIT Gandhinagar Foundation. And to pay our full-time directors of water and sanitation initially and uh, for uh, maternal and child health, we entered into a management services agreement under which we would, against milestones, were able to send them directly money in dollars, completely, totally legal. And that has worked remarkably well. And apparently to the best of our knowledge, even these new rules will not be affecting us. Thanks, uh, Ron. It is useful to many listeners here. There's a question again, topical, uh, which is around COVID. Uh, as all of us know that COVID is going to affect in terms of funds, infrastructure, etc. So question is, uh, what, according to the panel, uh, non-profit can sustain their infrastructure people post-pandemic in the view of raising the funds and all? So any, any thoughts all of you have how we are going to attack this next uh, challenge? Uh, it would be very useful to the panelists, I mean, the people who are asking these questions and NGOs around here. I, I'd, like to give a, I'd like to give a, a little perspective on this from my experience. A lot of NGOs are now spending money and supporting the COVID, uh, the fight against COVID, uh, because it is a good citizen obligation. You can't say no to that when government says do it because it's a good citizen thing. But actually, most NGOs are not qualified to do anything but spend some money, uh, and that's on you know the PPEs and so on and so forth. Which, to my mind, is not you know you may your specialty may be in technology, your specialty may be in grassroots delivery, you're suddenly spending money to buy suits, which government should be spending on. So in our program too, which we are very thinly funded, we didn't have the success, but we actually use the approach we have of detecting high-risk women, high-risk children at risk to find households at risk, individuals at risk. Where in a village do you find a hut which has got a migrant person, two aged parents in their 70s, two malnourished children and a pregnant woman. There are plenty of such places, but they're all hidden. So we use what we knew to, to go for that approach and said, we are not going to get into funding PPE and so on because it'll be a drop in the, in the ocean. So I'm saying there are not enough NGOs trying to use the skills they actually have and adapt those to the needs of the COVID epidemic. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, I think... Uh, one other thing, and I think which you touched on, Ashan, is uh, given the spending on uh, COVID-related items, there will be a squeeze on funding going towards the NGO from traditional sources of funding. And, you know, I'm saying, let's say CSR, Indian CSR, for instance. So, A, you know, because it's 2% of net income, that money is going to go down just because that incomes are going to go down over the next 12, 18 months. Number two, you've got the PM cares now, right? So a lot of corporate money is going into PM cares. 
So there will be a squeeze on traditional CSR funding. So I think what the NGOs may have to do is to look at other sources of funding. And one of them is probably high net worth individuals, both in India and outside, right? Because okay. that they need, definitely need to understand that the pie which they had projected pre-COVID is going to shrink. I hope all NGOs come out well after all this thing and we move ahead with the past speed as we are. Uh, there are a lot of questions on government, so I won't read uh, each of them, but basically question that is being asked is, you are all saying government is required, partnership is must, and I can also subscribe to it from my experience with uh, the party, which is a skill building organization, which is done very well with government partnership. People are asking, how do we get the buy-in of government? What are the do's? What are the don'ts? I mean, all of you have worked with governments. Uh, are there any distilled advice? I know it's a long answer, but whatever you can summarize. All of you. I, I, if I may say. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, the perspective many NGOs have is that we have a product, we have a solution, and now we want government's help in scaling that up. I think why should government help you scale up your solution? The NGO has to think what is government's problem? What does government want to see get done? And do I have the knowledge and the skills to help government do something in the national interest? This is a different way of doing it. And that's the reason why many NGOs say we don't want to work with government because that match doesn't happen. So match is one, one I think, important point of view. Yeah. I, I, think I, I also can, I'm sorry. Yeah, please, carry on. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I ahead, made a conscious decision not to work with the government, neither the state of Gujarat or at the end. What our goal was, which we wrestled with it for a very long time, that we first wanted to prove proof of concept. So in a sense, when you are working with IIT Kharagpur or IIT Bombay or IIT Gandhinagar, in a very different sense, you are working with the central government through the IITs. And they have a certain level of reputation of honesty and integrity that their results. And one other thing is anything that they do, we have made sure in our MOU, we have a clear and distinct language that any intellectual property developed from our grant, they can use it for other purposes, but we will be allowed to share it at no cost for social enterprises. So in that sense, we have been able to uh, work in some in interesting areas, but outside the government uh, tie up as such. Yeah, Karthik, you had something to say, I thought. Yeah, but I think uh, people, when they hear the word government, they think of Delhi, you know, and they think of South Block and North Block, but that's not what is required. An NGO really has to prove, you know, a pilot or a proof of concept, really starting from bottom up. So it has to start at block level, move to district level, and then move to state level. Okay, and, and that's where the government involvement is a must-have. If you can prove success, so, and I'm sure, you know, as Ashok had done, if you prove success in two districts, the state will run with the program. If you prove, the hypothesis is if you prove success in three states, that's when Delhi will take notice. So it is a bottom-up approach. It's not starting with Niti Ayo or the federal government schemes. Very true. Yeah, I, I think the other thing yeah. I'd like to mention is uh, basically you know, when in, in an industry, when you want to do a partnership with another entity or another company, it, you, you go about it in a way where it's a win-win for both. I think you tend to look at government very differently, that they should do what's right, and that it, you don't look at the win-win part at all, number one. So I think what uh, Ashok said is very valid, that you have to look at how is it a win-win and you've got to look at it from the government's point of view, number one. Number two, please go in with a lot of patience. Governments don't move quickly. They are not motivated by profit. They're not motivated. They're motivated by other things. And either you uh, 
put your finger on what motivates them, in which case you can probably move a little quicker, but it may not be, how should I say, too professional. Uh, but in a way, you have to have a lot of patience and a, a lot of frustration tolerance because even at a lower level, some minor bureaucrat can hold things up for a long time. And uh, you really can't go to the CEO or the chief minister or whoever is your uh, champion for every small thing. You have to try and clear things sometimes yourself and they take time. So I, I would say, you know, patience has to be a part of how you're dealing with government. Without that, you're not going to be successful in dealing with them. It's pretty much like how you sell to them. It just takes a lot of patience. You've got to, you know, build it up, get an RFP, get a tender, then quote, get, make sure three people have quoted, do an evaluation and then get the order. Why do you think this is any different? Although it might have a social good, it might be making a lot of difference, but uh, it just takes that kind of time. And so yeah, I think you've got to mentally be prepared to look at things that way. Yeah, thanks, Arvind. I agree. <laughs> it's, uh, my experience also says the same thing. But the results are fabulous. I don't know whether some of you have attended the uh, Parfi session, which was there two sessions ago in the same Wills, Wills event. Dr. Kalyan, who is our CEO there, talked about it. How we are just all over Jharkhand, for example, because we have a joint venture. Anyway, we don't have time for all that here. So I, I have a question of mine now to all of you. See, Wheels is about technology philanthropy. That's what we believe in. How to make uh, technology philanthropy happen, how to leverage technology. Now, it's not easy. So any thoughts on procuring technology, making it happen, there are issues with new technologies, you know, uh, so, some thoughts, it, it's kind of uh, free, free thoughts anyone of you can have from your experience of working with technology. <clears throat> uh, maybe I can answer yeah, in the areas that we have worked with. We do find some significant I'll, I will give you my experience in working with three different IITs. And unfortunately, one of them is not a good one. It happens to be my alma mater. Even though we gave a tremendous amount of money to a certain professor to establish his very innovative lab, expensive German equipment was acquired. But because of bureaucratic lethargy, that happens in, in, in infrastructure, at, at least at IIT Bombay. He was not given lab space for six months until I had to start yelling and shouting and break some heads. Compared that to IIT Kharagpur, they were extremely helpful. That right from the old director, not the current director, the one before him, we met in Washington, D.C. The project was approved. We funded it. They started construction, unfortunately, COVID caused some delays. But the best experience we had was at IIT Gandhinagar. Whatever we asked was instantaneously almost delivered. They are crying out for people approaching them. And as a result, it has been a wonderful experience. Our foundation is headquartered at IIT Gandhinagar Research Park. Okay, useful insight. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, I think we are also running short of time, so let me let me move this ahead uh, because we are we are, we are approaching nine o'clock. So uh, thanks, uh, Ron, Ashok, Arthik for your excellent remarks. Uh, thanks to Arjun, of course, uh, acting as a moderator. Thanks to entire team of volunteers and collaborators who have worked very hard to make this happen. So I'm going to do two things before ending. Uh, one is I'm going to ask each one of you just 30 seconds summary advice from all this uh, to each one of you. And then I will go to the key takeaways. Uh, take so 30 seconds each, uh, rapid fire if I may call it. Uh, let's start with who, who started the whole thing first. Ron, yeah, 30 seconds. Persistence. Um, don't ever give up. 
if you believe what you are working in is appropriate, keep at it. Don't ever give up. Thanks. That's a great advice. Yeah, Ashok. Donors should look for implementing NGOs who are much smarter than them and know much more about the problem. And they should respect the final beneficiary as knowing the most, even more than the NGO. Put it on its head and you'll be spending your money very wisely. Great advice for donors. Arti. You are, you are on silent, Karthik. I can't hear you. Karthik, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. No, I, I lost connection. So I'm just okay. back and just repeat the question. No, no. So I said 30 seconds summary of ah. today's session for you and your advice to all the uh, all the persons who are joining this call. Yeah, well, I'm going to just uh, build on uh, Ashok's model of changing the donor donate relationship. And, and even what uh, Arjun had said earlier, that at some point uh, you will run out of raising money. And what that means is that traditional donor money is a beneficiary directed. So every new beneficiary you add, you have to raise more money. And Arjun gave the example of Akshay Patra, right? Three million kids, 300 crores to be raised, only 1.5% of India's public school children. So I think what, what you really need is, whilst you will need uh, donor money to scale, simultaneously <coughs> the NGOs programs have to build systems, capabilities. So when they are, and working with the government, so when they are at scale, your donor money now drops significantly. So it's readily achievable, but more importantly, that the program is now running by itself. Maybe not at 100% efficiency as you want, maybe at 70%, 80%, but that is really the model to impact at scale. Okay, learning lesson from your scaling. Uh, 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 Arjun, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, I think, you know, people who get into trying to make a difference have to have a passion. You have, it's like an entrepreneur's journey. You have to have a passion, you want to change the world, uh, you have to think out of the box. Uh, you have to leverage technology in today's world. Uh, and you have to make sure that you leverage what's available. Don't try and recreate the infrastructure in whatever you're trying to do. Uh, I can't think of too many areas where the infrastructure doesn't exist. You just have to make it more effective. And you're seeing that very much in what Uber is doing, what Airbnb is doing. What a lot of these people are doing is they're taking... Uh, not fully utilized resources and monetizing them in some way. I think that's true for NGOs too. If you look at what's available and what you want to do, I think you should be able to make that connect and do it, uh, not necessarily for money or for losses, like people like Uber and all are doing, but to do it from social good, which is what most NGOs want to do. So I just leave Great. that thought to you. That try and Great advice. Great. Can... Yeah. So, uh... I, I want to move ahead with uh, takeaways. It's very ambitious to say what are takeaways. There are so many of them, but let me let me attempt quickly a few takeaways to all of you here. What is coming out are few 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 important important things. One is uh, you know uh, basically government is required for scaling. It's coming out very strongly here. Uh, we need to figure out how to work with government, but if you can, it will be a great thing to do. Second thing which is coming out is uh, community must lead in all stages. Involve, involve your beneficiaries, uh, and you, you will you will you will have a great great success. Uh, other one which is coming is uh, compliance, transparency are becoming in more and more important. Even even the kind of uh, things which are happening around us uh, from the donor's perspective, from the government perspective, uh, that is an important dimension you can't get out of. Uh, another takeaway which is important to my mind is uh, 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 is about uh, is about uh, sorry, I'll just uh, just give me one second. Uh, these integrative projects, uh, which are in water, health, sanitation, nutrition, can be scaled 
through collaboration with institutions like IIT for innovation and scientific research. There's so much of talent lying around in all our institutions, IITs and many others. Please, please leverage it. Let's 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 bring them into the fold and 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 make it make move ahead. Self-sustainable models are required, of course, if you want to scale up. Uh, and there is a great advice, of course, for don donors how they need to change the way they think about making change happen. How the partnership and how how how, how not to work uh, one way but completely another way, as Ashok uh, explained with his diagram, it, it is something very important. Uh, Few other things, quick ones are pilots are useful. We all know that whenever we build any organization, don't start grant. Start pilots, start convincing donors, start convincing communities, and then out of that learning things will happen. As persistence is very important, as Arjun and Ron said, that persistence comes out of these pilots and learning from pilots. Uh, important part is uh, prevention is far higher than cure. I think that's that's an important insight again. I think we all, uh, and and I think that that is health, of course, is direct beneficiary of that insight. But I think beyond health, I think look at how can we prevent the problem rather than solving a problem. Be it in education, be it in environment, focus your effort there. It will have be much more leverageable. Uh, so I think a uh, few others, but I think time is running out. Uh, uh, so, so this, 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 uh, these are, this is great uh, thing. Uh, anyway, some of these we'll publish in our uh, website, and we have a good, great uh, example of PyTech magazine. PyTech is an IIT and magazines which comes out uh, now, uh, and uh, it will, it will have its new issue soon, and they'll have some of these things. Uh, there is a link for today's event, wheelsglobal.org, W H E E L S global.org and wills charitable w h e e l s c h a r i t a b l e dot o r g uh, where there is a donate button also wearing my wills hat will be very happy to have your support uh, as, as as we talked about wills i will not spend more time talking about wills you saw our presentation you will see it again uh, please please help us to make things happen uh, on, on, on a national level, using technology, philanthropy in water, health, energy, education, sustainability, particularly at a smart village concept that we are now driving, uh, where we are looking at all the aspects of smart village and making change happen. Finally, thanks to all of you attendees, and we hope you will join us again next webinar on October 23rd, market, October 23rd, which is on education. There are Ajit George from Shanti Bhavan, Vinita Saraf from Ektara, Rashmi Mishra from uh, Vidya, with Anand Seth of Edu Girls as the moderator, and Kannan Mokulia from IIT Bombay of Open Tutorials that we heard earlier is going to be the uh, is going to be the chairman of the event. Uh, so don't don't miss this. All 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 very excellent initiatives we are. So stay safe, keep well, enjoy the rest of the uh, weekend, and remember will in your mind as you get out of this, and remember for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. 